I'm going to talk about um, work that I do, which is called social network analysis. And I'm going to talk especially about um, what you can do with data that you find on the net. So there's all sorts of interesting patterns in the net. And uh, I'm going to show you some examples and explain how I, how I got these. Most of the time, I work for um, large companies, um, nonprofits, once in a while a government institution, um, but mostly mapping out networks in these organizations or between these organizations and trying to help them understand how these networks work and how they can possibly work better uh, for these uh, various clients. So. Um, this whole, uh, this whole presentation kind of got started from this article that I, got, um, that I got mentioned in. And sometimes you don't know, you know kind of what you have until somebody tells you the, you know, the obvious. And so um, you know, I never thought of myself as a uh, kind of wiki intelligence kind of person wh when you know, the uh, Christian Science Monitor here wrote this thing up and I thought, yeah, well that's interesting. There's, there's not just this, this information about 9-11, but there's all sorts of other information out there that people can use as, as, as open source intelligence to do all sorts of interesting analysis for their own benefit or for any organization that they, that they work for. And so um, what I do is, is social network analysis and it's both a visual and a mathematical way of analyzing networks or analyzing how people interact, exchange information, how things flow from one object to another. And social network analysis was originally created back in the 30s and 40s uh, to, from a kind of a sociological and an anthropo anthropological perspective to look at people and their organizations but it's amazing how we can take that technology and actually analyze lots of different types of networks. So we can take social network analysis and we could actually uh, look at parts of the internet. We can look at how autonomous systems are connected and do analysis that way. We can look at uh, how books on Amazon are connected and we'll actually go through that example soon. So I started with a language called Prolog. How, how many of you even know what Prolog is? All right, how many of you have actually programmed in Prolog? Wow, that's great. How many of you still program in Prolog? Right, that's what I thought, no hands. <laughs> well, I actually still do some programming in Prolog, although um, I have programmers, and unfortunately, I have to go to London, England to find good Prolog programmers. And so uh, I still do some programming, and I send them specs in prolog code. So I'll write up some prolog code. They'll take a look at it, get a good laugh, and then you know my 80 lines of code, they'll change to 18 lines of code and, and send me something back. And, but but prolog is a great language, especially for, for, for networks, because it's, it's a relational language and networks are all about relationships and how things are related and how things flow. And it's a fun language to play around with. It's a fun language to, to experiment with. It's a fun language to try things out, see how they work. It's interpreted. You try, you know, you change something, try it, see how it works, and you just keep going. So it's, a, so it's fun to experiment, but then, you know, when I'm done experimenting and I think I got something, I send it off to, you know, to the real, the real programmers. But, you know, like I say, it's, it's fun for hacking sociology because networks are all about how people interact, how organizations interact, how communities interact, how groups interact. And so Prolog is a great language for, for modeling all that. And this is a simple interface of the software that uh, we developed many years ago. It's called Inflow, and it's uh, almost 100% Prolog. It's like 99% Prolog. And it's compiled and it runs, you know, runs pretty good, even though it's, uh, uh, you know, in, at the basis is an interpreted language. So those of you that miss Prolog, here's some Prolog code. And, uh, and here's some Prolog code that, that basically 
explains kind of what we do. And so you can see that, you know, it's very easy to quickly do something and, and, and get something done in Prolog. That's one of the things I like about it is, is you don't have to write lines and lines and lines of code. It's real easy to quickly state your problem and find a solution. So we can just, we can start very simply by just saying, you know, two people are friends. And then we could say, well, we could state two people are friends or we could give a rule for how people are friends. So the second uh, uh, predicate there, friend X and Y, a person X has a certain, certain types of interests, person Y has different interests. At the intersection of person's X interests and Y interests meet at least 50%, we'll consider them as possible friends. So kind of birds of a feather flock together. That's, that's the rule there. We can also do friend of a friend. So it's very simple that if uh, X and Y are friends and Y and Z are friends and X and Z are friends of friends. So again, two lines of code to quickly do a, a somewhat complex uh, relationship. We can find groups very easily too. So X and Y know each other, Y and Z know each other, X and Z know each other. That's the basis of a, of a group. No, I don't need that. And then um, social network analysis has, has, has metrics. And so one of the most simple metrics is this thing called degrees that just looks at how many connections you have. Again, just kind of two, two lines of code. Find all your friends, put, put them in a list, see how long the list is, and there's, there's your degree metric. And some of the other metrics are more complicated. But this is basically the way I started almost 20 years ago with this type of code. I had to do a project for, a class, for two classes I was taking at UCLA. And so I started with code like this. And then one thing led to another and eventually quit my day job and do this type of analysis full time. And uh, when you're looking on the net and you're looking for uh, data to map and data to analyze, uh, what we do is we often follow this uh, approach called snowball sampling. And since we're all in Cleveland, we're all very familiar with snowballs. And, and it, it's basically a way of following the data. So, so you start with, with one place, you start with a person, with an organization, with a, with a group, and we normally then go out two steps from that. So if you were to map a network around me, you would look at who, who I'm connected to. One of the people I'm connected to is right here in the audience, Steve Goldberg. Then you'd see who he's connected to, and you would go out two steps that way. And then you could quickly see the person, their friends, friends of friends, and, and you'd see the network around them. And then you combine these networks for, for various individuals or various organizations, and when they overlap, that's when you get this larger group network. And uh, so who has heard of the concept six degrees of separation? Okay, yeah, just about everybody. There's also a book out by that name. And what's the common thing? They tell us six degrees of separation, and then usually the second sentence you hear is, isn't, isn't it a small world? But actually, six degrees of separation is not a small world. It's a very large world. And what's a small world is two degrees of separation or two steps in the network. What we're finding in, in both practical experience and what the academics are finding in research is that every network has a horizon. So just like the planet has a horizon that we can't see over, same thing happens in networks. And that network horizon is somewhere around two steps. So we know, so I know Steve and I know a lot about him and I know Gloria and, and, and about her, but Steve's friends, uh, I kind of know who some of them are, but I don't know who all of them are. Same, same with Gloria's. But Steve's friends' friends, I basically know, know, know nothing about. And same with Gloria's friends' friends. And so at three steps, things start to get real fuzzy in, our, in the network, and at four steps, we're basically blind and in the network. So the, the key links, in any network, especially in your own social network, are the one and two step links. That's where you could do something, that's where you can influence things, and that's where uh, kind of the important relationships are. So when you 
get this data, you can track it in a spreadsheet. And here's a simple way that we track data. We look at the from node, the to node, and then the strength of the tie or the link, and then whatever network it's in. And so again, the data is real simple. Baldus is connected to Steve. Steve is connected to Gloria. We, again, we can see very quickly how, how the links grow and how the, how the networks grow. And you can keep a spreadsheet like this going as you collect data over time. Another way to do it is if you have software like, like what we have, is you can just draw the links in. So we have tools in there that allow you to just draw the network. And as you're drawing the network, the database gets created, the links get created, and everything is ready for you to go. So this is when I was doing the 9-11 network. I was basically reading the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, all sorts of things like that online. And when I'd find a new relationship, I'd say, ah, OK, I have both of these people already in here. I'd go get my link tool, and then I'd just drag from the node on the left to the node on the right. And it would then bring up a dialog box. I'd fill that in about the relationship, and boom, it's done. More, more of the network is, uh, is complete. So one of the first networks that I drew um, was this uh, network of internet industry partnerships. And, uh, and, this, and mostly, I got this information before the, uh, be, before the dot comedy broke and, and busted in early 2000. And this type of information is available all, in all sorts of places on the net. It's available as, as, as press releases. It's available on companies' websites. And basically, two nodes are linked together if they have announced some type of partnership, so either a strategic alliance or a joint venture or anything like that. So we see some of the big players are like IBM and Microsoft and, and AOL Time, Time Warner. And then if we want to, we can you know, zoom into that cloud of relationships and just look at two nodes off by themselves. So right here, we zoom in, and we just look at two nodes and their direct connections. So that's one step connection for, for each one. And then we see that some of the links overlap. Um, George Nemeth, who, who does Brute, Brute Fresh Daily, and I were uh, working with uh, Ed Morrison, who was at REI at the time. And we were wondering what, what the Cleveland economic development community looks like. So George and I spent a couple hours on the web, just going from website to website of various Cleveland organizations, just looking how, how we're connected. So we see the Cleveland Foundation on here. We see all the universities. We see uh, BioEnterprise. We see uh, Glide. You know, we see all sorts of Gun Foundation, all sorts of organizations. And all this information is, is available on their, on, the, on their website. They say partners, you know, these are people we're funding, things like that. And so again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to spot the relationships that are obvious in the, in the data that's out there. So again, a couple hours of web surfing, just keeping those link pairs, putting them in a spreadsheet. George sent me what he found. I combined it with what I found. And we had a quick map of of Northeast Ohio's economic development community. A friend of mine uh, works up at uh, University of Michigan, and he has access to all sorts of autonomous system data. So once in a while, he'll send me some things, and he'll say, here, map this out and figure out you know, who's the most central node and who's, who, who's clustered and so on. So, this, again, is just a very, very small part of the internet, but these are all autonomous systems, and they're connected to each other um, by, by the routing protocol. So one routes, routes to, to the other. And, and we see that the autonomous systems are much more in a kind of a hub and spoke design as, as opposed to a social network, which is a much denser network. It doesn't have the same kind of hub and spoke architecture or, or topology. So we can sometimes tell what type of network we're looking at by the patterns 
that, that we see in it. So usually networks like this that have lots of hubs and spokes are usually man-made networks, whereas networks that have a lot of interconnectivity are often emergent networks, so either social networks or, or biological networks. I did some work uh, with this academic in, in Spain who had gathered data on the Spanish blogosphere. He had gotten data on like about a thousand different blogs in uh, mostly in Spain, but these are all uh, that use the Spanish language as, as the main language. And he sent me the data and we did some simple analysis to see you know who are, who are the dominant blogs and, and who's, who, who are key connectors and, and where are various clusters. These are tech blogs, these are political blogs, these are something else. So again, um, very simple data. Who, who was who was actually pointing to whom in the blog posts. And you could do blog networks a couple ways. You can look at the blog roles, so who mentions who in the blog role. But blog roles aren't, aren't always accurate, and they tend to get less and less accurate as time goes on because people don't change them day to day. But if you look at the posts of who's pointing to whom in a post, you can get a very accurate picture of, of um, kind of the social network of a, of a particular uh, area. And we also did something like this for, for Northeast Ohio, but I don't have that, that picture up here. Another uh, interesting blog map was, was this one, where there was this, um, this woman in, in New York. She was a PR executive, and um, one day fell ill, went to the hospital, and discovered that she needed a liver transplant, and she needed it within like two weeks. So all of her friends, many of them who, whom were bloggers and other people in the PR industry, started to blog about this that, you know, help Sherry find a liver. And uh, so a couple of them set up websites, and those are the, um, the magenta or the pink colored nodes. And these websites told people that if you know somebody that can, that can um, you know, that can donate the organ or so on, um, you know, th here's, here's the information that's necessary. And then the green nodes are all the different blogs, and the blue nodes are the mainstream media that's, that, that picked up the story. So what we actually did, this is just one snapshot in time, but we took like three different snapshots. We took it uh, about four days after this, this news broke, and then, uh, and then we took it... Uh, at this time and then right, right before they, they found the donor. And so it was interesting how it started over here with this, uh, with this one on the far right, this uh, O'Dewar's PR uh, blog. It started there and it kind of spread to the rest of them. But, uh, but as you notice, as people blogged about it, they always pointed to the two sites that ha had the information that people needed to to, um, you know, to be able to help her with her, with her transplant. So uh, I'm sure everybody's got an iPod, right? Or knows somebody that has an iPod. And, and most people, again, we were talking about this earlier, about how um, everybody thinks that innovation happens by just one individual. So, you know... Apple gets all the credit for doing the iPod, and Steve Jobs gets most of the credit for having Apple do, do the iPod. But actually, Apple started with a very small group there, with a very small ecosystem. That's the group on the far left there. That was in 2001. And uh, all those companies got together, and Apple was kind of the ringleader, but all those companies had to come together, share their technology, to create the initial iPod. And then in 2004, the Apple iPod uh, ecosystem had grown much larger. All these magenta colored nodes were various uh, suppliers of, of add-ons to the iPod. You had now competitors coming in, the yellow nodes. You had the record companies involved with, with uh, music that they were providing either to, to, the, to, to iTunes or to other places. 
And so this whole ecosystem was growing. And now in 2007, this ecosystem is probably two or three times as complicated as you see there. So again, you start small, and industry ecosystems can grow very big. And what we can do with these networks is not just map them out and show what they look like, but we can measure them too. We could find what are the most central nodes, what are the most connected nodes, what are the nodes that act as bridges so that in order to get from one part of the ecosystem to the other, you have to go through this bridge, you have to go through this node. Which ones are brokers or, or gatekeepers? So anyway, 9-11. Um, uh, when 9-11 when happened, I, was, I, I had already uh, started my, my business and I was kind of a struggling you know, software entrepreneur, management consultant, and things, were, things weren't grow, going that well in 2000. 2001, things started going better and then all of a sudden 9-11 happened. People just didn't want to talk to consultants anymore, especially not independent consultants. So after 9-11, you know, kind of my, my whole world came, came to a halt. And so I had a choice. I could, I could sit there and, um, and watch CNN and watch, you know, for the 54th time the planes hit the buildings, or I could start to do something different. And I kept hearing this term, terrorist network. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm supposed to be this expert at networks, then I should know what one of these looked like. But I didn't know what one looked like. So uh, I called some of my friends who were also experts at networks, and they said, yeah, we don't know what one looks like either. And so they said, you know, we know a little bit about criminal networks and, and things like that, but, but nobody had really mapped a, a terrorist network before. And if they had mapped it, it was, you know, at the NSA, and they don't publish their work. So, um, so I thought, well, try to map it. And uh, what, what um, I discovered was that after 9-11, after the newspapers had all sorts of information about who was connected to whom and who was involved and so on. So slowly, I started to, to map this information out. And so eventually, um, you'll see we got the full map, but the map really started with these two people. And these two people were actually known before 9-11. CIA knew about these two people, knew that they were connected, uh, didn't know that they were in America, but knew that they had attended a, an Al-Qaeda meeting in uh, Malaysia. And so if, if we would have been doing this type of analysis to these highly suspect people, you know, we would have now taken their direct connections, and this could have been done with perfectly legal surveillance. You know, didn't have to do any, any of the stuff that, uh, you know, the Bush administration's been doing. This could have been done with uh, FISA warrants. And because these two people were, were known suspects, and everybody around them now are the direct connections. And we can see that I've labeled the people that were on the planes in 9-11 by color. And we can see that already you know, many of the people are starting to show up. So these are one step away from the original two suspects. And then if we go two steps away, which I talked about before, we see that we have everybody that, was, that were on the planes. And we also see, um, we see Mohammed Atta right here, who was eventually figured out that he was, he was the ringleader. And we see how important he was. And he was the ringleader. So what he really was, was he was the project manager. So he was the one that had to get things done locally. And we don't see Osama bin Laden or any of those other names on here, because they were back there. They had given this assignment. These people came over here and did this project. And so, so we see how everybody was connected. We see who all the people were on the planes. And we also see that the pilots were, were some of the key connected people. And one of the things that, that really got me going in this whole mapping process was this, this particular matrix that showed up uh, in two places. I think it showed up in the New York Times, but I found it in an Australian paper on, online. 
and it basically gave the hijackers who was on what plane, and then it even started to give some information about how they were connected. So, you know, these two people went to school together in Germany, and these two people uh, were known to have lived together in the U.S., and so on. And so that's how the network started. So every day for the rest of 2001 till the end of the year, got up in the morning, would check all the newspaper sources and add, and add to the network. And luckily I was doing this because um, around Thanksgiving I got a call. And I got a call um, from, a, from a, a journalist that was writing an article for Business 2.0. And he was writing an article for how, um, how we were responding using science to, 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 to the terrorist threat. And he had written something that had mentioned me before. And so he said, Valdis, you, you know, you're, you're the network guy. You know, would you happen to have something on, on, on the terrorists or know somebody that does? And I said, well, yeah, I just happened to have worked on it. And here it is. And he said, oh, well, this is great. And they had also gathered some other information. So we took his information and my information, put it together. And I got it published in the, in the December 2001 issue of Business 2.0. And it was, it, was a good, it, was a good, it was a good marketing piece for a small-time entrepreneur on the west side of Cleveland. So. Uh, so here is then the map after, after, the, you know, after the three months. So this was basically the map that got published in, uh, in Business 2.0. We fixed it up, made it look a little nicer, and drew the pilots together here. And again, we see how he they were, because they were, these, these are them right here. And we see, see how connected they were. So in, in one sense, you know, Al put a lot of, resources into these four people and it was really not the wisest thing for them to do because by being so well connected they were probably the most discoverable of everybody in the network and they were also the people that had the most skills to get things done that they were trying to do so in that sense it wasn't the wisest approach on their part but they were able to get away with it because we weren't aware of what was going on so, um, some other non-standard networks that I've worked on are uh, book networks. So, these are based on data from Amazon that look at um, which books are bought together. So, it's kind of a social network of books. So, uh, I, I went on Amazon today and there's a new book that's coming out by George Tennant. Um, and it's not out yet, but it's called At the Center of the Storm. But people are already pre-ordering pre it. And these are the books that, that the people that are ordering this book or, or that will buy this book have also bought. So people that, that are buying this book have bought the 1% solution, have bought State of Denial. And that then connects these books together. So these, are, these books are like are like friends because they're, they're being bought by the same people together. And so what we do is we can then draw a map of the books just like a social network. And what I did in, back in 2004 was I, was I drew this map and I hadn't colored the nodes at all. They were all gray. And then I let the software organize the network, how it does according to its algorithm, and it came up with these two obvious groups with a in the middle. So I thought, OK, well, let's see what's in these obvious groups. And I started looking at this one. And it's, it's pretty obvious that these are all the right-wing books. Started looking at that one. And it was pretty obvious that those are all the left-wing books. And so I just colored them blue and colored them red and, and published this. And a lot of people thought, wow, this is, this is interesting. And so, again, with, you know, basically with about an hour's time spent with Amazon, I was basically finding out the same information that we're, we're, we were a, kind of a divided nation in 2004 that all these other uh, studies were doing. And so this was the original layout on the right, and that's how the uh, 
software showed the emergent pattern. And then on the left, what I did is I just put the two sides into arcs and displayed them in uh, alphabetical order. So it was easier to read. So this is, this is a little more messy, but this shows the, the emergent pattern. That's a little more cleaner, but the links you see on the right are the same links that you see on the left. So it's basically the same, same thing. It's interesting you have so few in the middle. Are they integrators? Are they just rigid lobby? And who are they? Well, um, they're, they're kind of integrators. Um, because this one here, one of the gray nodes is at war which was one of, um, oh, what was that guy's name? Woodward, yeah. It was one of Woodward's three books about the Iraq War. And this was one of the ones where he was fairly positive about Bush. His last one, State of Denial, he was, fair, he was fairly negative. So it was actually bought by both sides, but a little more by the, by the right. And then this other one, All the Shah's Men, talked, again, it was probably in kind of a middle of the road book, but more people on the blue side. And then this sleeping with the devil was, was right in the middle. So in fact, I think sleeping with the devil was, um, again, it was something about, about the Mideast and something we had done wrong many years ago. So, so both sides were looking at that. But I was amazed at how divided it was. I was expecting a lot more interconnections. I was expecting this kind of clustering, but not as distinct as it, as it's very as severe, up. and it makes you wonder if that if there's money in keeping people apart and keeping them at odds. Well, well, one of the things that that Amazon does is you know they show you, you know, people that bought this book also also bought these books, but it is basically the data that they have, and it's also but the other thing is it's just data on higher selling books. So if there's a book that is really in the middle, but it only sells 50 copies, that's not going to show up here because it's not going to have the same amount of um, sales figures that the rest of them have. And what Amazon does is they give you like the top 100 books, and so there has to be some, some cutoff. I'll come right back to you. There's another question here. OK. Just because Amazon said, you know, if you, if you buy this book, other people bought these books, how do you know it's just not Amazon saying, you know, if you buy this book, you ought to buy this book? How do you know that information is factual? Well, yeah, and that's, you know, Amazon tells us that it is actually sales. They, they have a couple other areas where, where, where they'll show, you know, recommended books. Like, you know, they'll show a book and then they'll say, you know, buy these two together. And those aren't necessarily books that are high sales, but, but there's, yeah, there's two ways that you can get this data. You can get this data by just going page to page and, and gathering it manually, or if you have access to the Amazon API, you can also suck this information out and then um, and get it here. But yeah, I mean, there is some basic sense of trust we have to have in Amazon that, that these are the actual numbers and, and these are the ones that are sold. Now, I talked to... Um, their, their chief scientist, and he actually shows one of these in one of his presentations, and he, he told me, yeah, swear to God, it's, it's the real numbers, but, but uh, you know, we, we have to trust but verify, right? Okay, so, um, so these were, so I looked at a lot of books in 2004, but I thought, you know, what if I just look at the top 10? So rather than looking at the top 100 best-selling political books, what if I just look at the top 10? What, what patterns do I get then? And in 2006, these were the patterns. So we had, we had kind of a right-wing cluster, we had the left-wing cluster, and we had this new cluster that was neither right nor, nor left. And a lot of these were economic books. So the world is flat, free economics, the tipping point, uh, guns, germs, and steel. But then there's this new little cluster that's kind of a, an anti-religious anti cluster that's forming. The end of faith, the God delusion, uh, misquoting Jesus, and then letter to a Christian nation. So these are all 
Um, these are all really kind of anti some of the some of the red books. So this was this was an interesting pattern to see these three clusters two years later. And again, this was right after the November 2006 elections when, uh, when the Republicans lost and the Democrats won back a lot of seats. So there's lots of data on Amazon, lots of interesting patterns. We can look at political books, but you could probably look at technical books. You know, people that uh, look at certain Linux books, what else are they looking at? Uh, you know, Java books, what else are they looking at? Uh, uh, you know, BSD, Unix BSD, what are they looking at? You know, all sorts of things versus Red Hat. Um, Oracle versus Sybase, all sorts of uh, interesting patterns you can find. Another place that I found some interesting data was at, uh, at, at Harvard. And what Harvard does is, um, they tell us all about their illustrious faculty. And, uh, and, they, and they tell us you know, who these people are and how to contact them and their pages. But what they also tell us are areas of interest. So we see that Clayton Christensen here, and for those of you that don't know, he's, he's a famous researcher and publisher of, around innovation. So a lot of his uh, books on innovation have been, been top sellers. But we see you know, what his areas of interest are. And so we see the primary topics, the additional topics, and then also what industries he's interested in. And we have this on every single professor at Harvard. So again, we can look for the overlap of, uh, of interests or industries or combine the two and find emergent networks. So again, these people might not necessarily know each other, but the more interest they have and the more they are located in one particular school, the better chance that they know of each other. So again, we, no one's giving us the social network data, but we're deriving it from things that we know about. So we take all this data, we can put it in the software, and here's a pattern of uh, the business school faculty. So we see that there isn't like one big cluster. There's, you know, there's some... There's a cluster down here, and there's another cluster here, another cluster here, and then a you know cluster way out here. So you know, so if you're if you're trying to figure out a business school to go to, and um, and the professors in the per particular business school that, or in the particular discipline that you're interested in, are up here. And maybe Harvard's not the place for you to go. But if the people that you're interested in taking classes from are down here or down here, they're much more central, they're much more focused, maybe Harvard's the right place for you. And that's, that's the professors, but we have two pieces of information. We have professors and how they overlap in interests, and then we have interests and industries and how they overlap in professors and people that choose these things. So we can map the interests too. And we can see that the interests are much more clustered together. So again, you know, if, if, uh, if my major is going to be whatever 017 here is, then again, Har Harvard might be a good place for me to go because there's a lot of connectivity around that. But if my uh, interests are around, you know, 119 or 35 or 41 or even out here, then again, maybe, maybe Northwestern's a better school or maybe Case is a better school. So again, it's, it's a way that we can get some insight into what's going on without having the actual data. So we can derive data from knowing what choices people are making. So, um, next one. Uh, I have a very interesting client in Los Angeles, and I won't mention their name. Um, but um, they, they're an economic justice organization. So they, they fight for the little person that can't fight for themselves. And they're, they're basically, they've been, one of the battles that they've been carrying on is against this group of slumlords in the area that they're interested in. And uh, how, how many of you have heard of the Morrison Hotel? 
Okay, so it's a record by the doors, right? But it's an actual hotel there, and it's still standing, and it's now one of these slum properties that's, that's owned by this, this group of slum lords. And, and little children that are living in that building are getting lead poisoning all the time. And the city, LA, of course, doesn't support that. So they try to um, get the owners of the building to fix up the building to bring it up to code. But what happens is that the city is always one step behind. So um, somebody owns a bad building, people are getting lead poisoning or something else is going wrong there. City comes and says, you have six months or eight months, whatever, to fix it, or you know, we're going to slap this huge fine on you. City comes back after six months and says, have you fixed it? Guy says, no, nope, sorry, I don't own the building anymore. I sold it. OK, so then city tries to figure out who owns the building now, and has it been improved? No, it hasn't, and the problem goes on. City's always one step behind. As soon as you know, it's supposed to be fixed, sorry, I sold it. So what's going on is basically something like this, where you'll have these limited liability corporations that own these buildings, and they basically one sells to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other. And you would think, you know, who in their right mind would want to buy a building with all these violations in it? It just doesn't, just doesn't make sense. So what we're going to do now is... Uh, I'm going to show you some software that's pre-beta, so if it doesn't work, it's not my fault. And what's going on here? Okay, here it is. So we have the same thing here again. We have, and the network that's shown is the real estate sale. So ABC, limited liability corporation, sells it to DEF, limited liability corporation, and so on. And again, what we've done here is this isn't, this isn't the real data from the client. This is stuff I've made up, but this mimics the kind of analysis that they did to, uh, to help the city bring down this, this uh, ring of uh, slumlords. So what happened was that uh, they saw this and everything looked fine. You know, it's one company selling a building to another. What's wrong with that? There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. And then when they went to the um, city records, to see who was um, connected to these businesses, they found that, okay, you know, Beverly and Ed are connected with uh, ABC, so is Andre, Diane and Carol are too. So, you know, these people own, own these li li limited liability corporations and everything seems to be fine. Well, then they dug a little deeper and uh, somebody told them that, you know, what, re what, what, what this really is, is this is a big family operation. These people are all related. But they had to look that information up, and then they had to show the city and the city prosecutor what was going on. So they were able to look that information up, and they found that these weren't just a bunch of individual business people doing business. These were indeed a family that was all connected through marriage and through, through bloodlines. And, and Heather here was kind of like the family matriarch. And she had been married twice, and she had this one family here and this other family here. And, um, and she herself wasn't connected to any of these LLCs. And that you often find in criminal organizations is the, the top person, the kind of the brains behind the whole thing, remains disconnected or not obviously connected. So she had this family ring of her first marriage and her second marriage that were basically running these, uh, all these slum properties in Los Angeles. And when the prosecutor saw this, that was kind of all the information they needed. And these people were actually brought to court. And once they saw not just this evidence, but some other evidence, you know, they, they sold everything and theoretically moved out of town. But so, and plus they got you know, all sorts of fines for, for you know, trying to uh, get out of doing things. But these, this is one thing about networks is that the real networks that are really in power, that are getting things done, 
aren't always visible. And if you just look at, you know, again, if we, if we ignore the family network, which is really what brings the whole picture together, this looks like a very typical business network. And if we just, you know, if we let the software just organize it, you know, very typical chain. You know, these people organize here, sell, nothing wrong. But when we, you know, we show those family links, we see, aha, you know, there's, there's something else going on here. So, um, lost my cursor. OK, so we're all familiar with surveillance and how the government is supposedly watching our phone calls and our email and all sorts of other interesting things like that. Well, there's this word called surveillance, and then who knows French? Who can pronounce this? Surveillance? OK. So there's surveillance, watchers watching us, there's surveillance us that are being watched, watching the watchers. So, um, and that's basically what, what the uh, definition in Wikipedia uh, defines. So um, the, the first person to do this was this guy named Mark Lombardi. And he was an artist. And in fact, he had a show here in Cleveland at, uh, at Cleveland MoCA probably about three years ago. And what he did was he discovered that um, he could draw these drawings of actual conspiracies, and he can also make them as art. And he, you know, he can fulfill his life as an artist by drawing these. And so this one right here, this first one, um, you know, there is George H.W. Bush. This is all about a bunch of oil interests that the Bush family had. And what, and what he basically did was he would get out these books and these newspaper reports that would describe this stuff, and then he would draw these, these drawings. And he did these all by hand. I know what the algorithms are like in the software, and they're very complex, and they go through hundreds, if not thousands, of iterations to lay out the network in a nice, pleasing way. But he did this all by hand. So it's quite amazing. So here's another one of his where he would put things in a circle. And again, everything fit together pretty nice. You see there's, there's no lines that cross. You know, everything is nice and neat. So it was amazing what he was doing. And he would you know, put these up as, as art in, in various exhibitions. Unfortunately, he, uh, he committed suicide uh, before 9-11. So he, he would have actually been kind of an interesting person to look at what he would have done with that, uh, with that information. And, and the reason that he committed suicide, or so the story goes, was that um, he, had, he had been this artist, and, and not a very successful artist, so he had spent time as a museum curator. But then he started doing these drawings, and he started becoming more and more famous as an artist. And so this uh, large uh, art gallery in, um, or, or actually museum, I think it was the Whitney Museum in New York, asked him to display his works. And so he did this huge work that was basically the size of this stage. So this, this big, big drawing, and his drawings were like that. They were long, long rolls of paper that had these things going on and on. And he did this inside his apartment. And just when he was finished, the apartment above had some pipes break, and his, his drawing was ruined, and he had a week to go until his big, big exhibition at the Whitney. So he spent that whole week on coffee, not sleeping, redoing this whole thing. And they said, you know, at the end of that week, of course, you know, with sleep deprivation, and he was nearing, he was just about to have his 50th birthday, so he wasn't a spring chicken anymore. So it was tough for him to, to, to make it through that. And they said, you know, with the pressure of that and, and losing the sleep, he just snapped and, 
committed suicide. Well, then there's the other story that says, well, maybe that's not true. The kind of people that he was drawing were probably not very happy to, to be shown connected to the various people they're connected to. So I saw his uh, presentation, and you could see in some of those where you have US presidents and Saddam Hussein within you know, one or two links of each other. So these people probably aren't happy to see that and have somebody document that. So there was that whole other side that said, oh, he probably didn't commit suicide. He, you know, maybe somebody helped him. So nobody knows what really happened, but, the, but most people think it was, it was suicide because there were no signs of forced into his apartment, things like that. But anyway, but he started doing this, and unfortunately, he never um, met any of the social network people because it would have been interesting to have him actually talk to social network people and the two to, to share ideas of, uh, of how to do things. But anyway, uh, his, uh, his legacy kind of lives on, and a lot of people, especially a lot of the newspapers now, are starting to do these types of analyses when, they, when there's a very complex story going on. And one of the uh, most complex stories that have been going on in, in Washington of, of recent is this whole thing around Jack Abramoff, who was this um, lobbyist who got into lots of trouble, was paying off all sorts of people, and and was taking money from, uh, from Indian tribes and all that. And it's, you know, it's a long story. But a friend of mine started to do this with, uh, with Inflow and, and, and got this far with the map. And then, um, then uh, couldn't finish it. But, um, but it was amazing how much information was out there. So there was this place uh, called Think Progress. And they had, you know, Again, the whole scandal, and they had details on everybody involved and how they were involved. So again, the data's there. We just have to now map it into a network. And so they had information like this. So, you know, Tom DeLay, everything that he did, what he was involved in, who he was connected to. And so again, the data's there. You just have to visualize it as, as links and as, as nodes. And... Um, so we see this map showed up, I think this was in the New York Times. So again, it shows, shows Jack Abramoff there in the middle, and it shows some of the people that he was connected to in some of the organizations. It shows how money was flowing. And again, so uh, it's interesting now to see that the newspapers are actually printing these maps. And of course, they have artists that make these things look, look real nice. You know, they have a pretty picture, they have different colors. They make nice curved lines, so if you're good at Illustrator, you can do nice, nice maps like this. And then um, this other one, uh, this guy was, uh, was a uh, defense contractor, kind of one of the so-called Beltway Bandits, and he was involved in some of these shady deals, and we see that, again, you know, he was linked to Abramoff, he was linked to DeLay, um, you know, here's some other people in Congress down here. And so another network map that shows this interconnectivity. And then finally, there's this one out of the Houston Chronicle that again shows uh, Abramoff and DeLay and, and George Bush and, you know, a bunch of people here. Um, and again, how, how they were connected and, and, and what they were connected. And so it's, it's interesting that these very complex stories are now being accompanied by these diagrams that explain you know, what's going on, who's connected to whom, how, how, how the money is flowing, and so on. So now when people say, follow the money, we actually have maps that, that do that. So that's it. Any, any more questions? Right. Can you, can you win that contest? Or? Well, you know, I actually looked at that data, and they have very little social network data in there. They have data about how people rated things, but I, I, I know very little about how those people are connected to each other. So um, if I knew that, then, yeah, that would be a fairly easy problem. So if I knew that you, you related 
you rated things a certain way, and you were connected to this other group of people that rated things a certain way, and then Steve was one step away, that would, that would make that problem very easy. But just knowing that a bunch of disconnected people did these various ratings, I can figure out who, who may like to know each other, but if one's in Alaska and one's in Alabama, you know, that doesn't make sense. So there was, there's a key piece of information missing there. And I don't know if they have it or not, but if they have it, they should release it. And the other thing is, too, they're offering a million dollars for that, and if you figure that out, it's worth a lot more than a million bucks. It's, it's, like, it's like Google, too, if you figure that out. Hmm? So yeah, if there, if there was some social data there, that would be, be a much easier problem. Any, uh, any other questions? Right. One of the things that it talks about is that there's a number of um, conclusions come to from st statistical information and so forth that are kind of startling and against conventional interest from the things you've done over these last five, 10 years. Is there anything that really just set you back on your heels saying, wow, I would not have seen that unless the software revealed it, the analysis revealed it. What's been the biggest startlement to you? Well, you know, just some of the things that I mentioned, you know, I was, I was surprised at how well the books mapped, you know, the other conventional wisdom, the other studies that were being done that we were this, you know, this, this divided nation. Part of that, I was just, I was, I was hoping actually that it would show something different. And what was interesting was that not only did those books show that, but um, I have some other colleagues that, uh, that studied the political blogs, and they showed that same type of divide. Although the political blogs didn't show as distinct of a, of a divide, but what, uh, what, what the researchers that did that said about that was that a lot of the links from the red to the blue and from the blue to the red were just sniping at each other, saying, you know, look at what a jerk this guy is and look what he's saying, not pointing in a positive way. So those were a lot of the cross-boundary connections there. So they were just about as, as divided. I'm wondering if you'd considered incorporating time series data into that, maybe through the use of animation or something, so you can look at how this progresses over time. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's fairly easy to do. You can you can do time series data um, by capturing the history as you go, and then you can actually show an animation, or you could just capture month, 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 and then just show how it how, how it changes across that. Uh, but the thing that you have to be careful about networks is that again. A lot of links are formed at one time, and then they stay dormant, and they're not obvious, and yet they're still there. So, so Steve and I have a, have, have a link, but we don't talk to each other every day or, or even every, every, every week, but it's there. If I need to talk to him, if he needs to talk to me, he, he can get it. If somebody was watching us, they may not realize that, that, that we're connected. Okay, 